you should see the, the presentation on yep. full screen. Is this right? Yep, it looks good. All right, great. So our second speaker for today is Philip Pauka from University of Trento, and he'll tell us about quantum simulation of lattice gauge theories. So go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Matthew. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this opportunity to present uh, some of our recent, the recent works here. So uh, I'm very uh, gracious for that. Um, yeah, so the subtitle of my talk is uh, High Energy Physics in the Laboratory. Uh, but, but usually when you think about high energy physics, we don't think about uh, small scale laboratory experiments. We rather tend to think about these huge large scale facilities uh, such as at CERN. Um, now here experimentalists, they try to understand extreme forms of matter such as the quark gluon plasma, uh, which is a state of matter very highly out of equilibrium with a very high energy that is produced by these heavy ion collisions. Um, now, uh, so this is not only an experimental effort, it's also a huge uh, theoretical effort, of course, and for example, the calculation of gauge theories uh, that describe these, for example, this quark gluon plasma, uh, that is one of the main drivers of uh, scientific high performance computing. So what we aim for is instead of looking at such gauge theories with classical computers, we want to implement them into quantum devices, such as uh, trapped ions or uh, neutral atoms or uh, superconducting devices. Uh, so this is really in the spirit of the Feynman quantum simulator. We want to take the model and implement it in an as exact way as possible in these quantum devices. Um, well, now gauge theories, uh, so here this is the a sketch of the uh, standard model of particle physics, but they're not only relevant for high energy or nuclear physics. Um, as you heard from uh, Jason, uh, they also appear as emergent phases in, in condensed matter. And we can also understand, uh, for example, error correcting codes as uh, uh, sketch theories. Uh, and so back in Innsbruck, we had also a paradigm for adiabatic quantum optimization, which can also be understood as a gauge theory. Okay, so there's a huge interest actually in gauge theories uh, from different fields, from different perspectives. And uh, this interest that has, has driven a large uh, experimental and theoretical effort to implement gauge theories uh, in quantum devices. Um, and so back in 2016, when I was still in Innsbruck, in a very strong collabora collaboration between uh, the group of Peter Zoller and the group of Rainer Blatt, uh, we were able to uh, develop an algorithm for a trapped ion quantum computer, which uh, then was implemented by the group of Rainer. And so that was really the first quantum simulation uh, of a lattice gauge theory in a, uh, in a quantum computer. Um, so that was back in 2016. And I think this really has opened the floodgates. So then there are more and more and more experiments that are coming up. Uh, so here, these are only the experimental citations, I hope I uh, catched all of them, but it's very fast developing. So it uh, might well be that I've always seen something. And uh, so just the theory work, I could not uh, write down. It's uh, much too many uh, works that are now appearing. Um, so, but, okay, but there's more in, in these reviews uh, if you're interested. Um, okay, so this means it's really an uh, accelerating development and it's uh, an exciting time for this field. Uh, but also we should not maybe be, become too arrogant now because actually we are just doing the first steps. So most of these experiments uh, that I've cited here, uh, they're just proofs of principle of very small systems. Okay, so we are a very far stretch away from simulating things like uh, quantum chromodynamics and things, uh, the standard model of particle physics. Okay. Um, so the question is how can we push forward? And um, so I want to touch on a few steps that uh, can give us uh, advances into the right direction and organize it to say my, my talk around these uh, next steps. So, um, so the immediate thing that we need is we need to go beyond proofs of principle to really have scalable implementations. Um, and then before we need to look at the quark gluon plasma, uh, which is very complicated, we want to identify what the relevant phenomena that are accessible right now uh, in these quantum devices. So that we, while uh, pushing forward, we can already do interesting physics and learn also new uh, fundamental things. Um, 
And then while we scale everything up, we also need to make sure that the quantum simulator keeps the work uh, reliable. And so these are, uh, at least in my personal point of view, the next steps, and I want to touch a little bit on them. And uh, so these are, let say, three um, points I'm going to discuss in this talk. Um, so regarding the scalable implementation, I'm going to discuss this recent experiment that uh, was done in the group of uh, John Wei Pan, who has one experiment in Heidelberg where Bing Yang was the senior postdoc uh, who on the experimental side uh, really pushed this very, very strongly and made it possible actually that uh, our theoretical ideas could be implemented in, the, in an optical lattice. Um, I guess I'm going to discuss this optical lattice uh, implementation. Um, well, okay, so uh, what is the model that we're going to look at? Uh, I mentioned quantum chromodynamics, but uh, that's much too complicated for now. So let's take something simpler. And while we take quantum electrodynamics and only in one spatial dimension, um, it is a simple model, but it hosts also very, very interesting physics. Um, and yeah, so Jason also showed us the Dirac cone, so there's actually uh, the, some uh, connections. So we also here have the Dirac uh, spinors, uh, these fermion spinors here. Um, they have a rest mass. Um, so they describe uh, positrons and electrons which have the rest mass, then these uh, particles can move, so they have a kinetic energy, uh, but now they should be charged particles. You want to do QED. So there has to be an electric field from the positive to the negative charge. And now what's important, once the negative charge moves, the electric field should not just stand around there um, and as a bystander, but it has to instantaneously adapt to this new configuration. Okay? Um, and so to achieve this, we add the vector potential in minimal coupling uh, as is usual. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian of QED. Uh, so it contains these two coupled degrees of freedom, the uh, fermionic matter and the bosonic gauge field. And we want these two degrees of freedom because these gives, uh, gives, uh, give us very rich physics. Um, so we get a uh, Coleman's phase transition, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later. Um, this gives us the Schwinger mechanism of particle generation out of the vacuum out of a strong uh, electric field. Um, it gives us the topological theta vacuum, uh, a toy model for confinement and so on. So a very rich physics in there. Um, but, but now, so if you look at the quantum simulator, it's not enough to just put in there some different degrees of freedom, for example, throw bosonic and fermionic atoms in some optical lattice and then that's it. Uh, no, there has to be a very specific dynamics behind it. So we really want to have the local gauge symmetry and uh, as I, as I said here, we want to really engineer it microscopically, so not have it emergent, uh, which I think is also very interesting, but here we take a different approach to really try to engineer the gauge symmetry microscopically. Okay. So for the quantum electrodynamics, uh, this means nothing else than the, the Gauss's law. We have that the divergence of the electric field minus the charge density, this has to be zero. So we can define the generator of Gauss's law uh, which acting on the wave function should give zero for all uh, points in space and time. And so this has to be a conserved quantity of our Hamiltonian if you want to do a gauge theory. Um, well, said, uh, pictorially, uh, this ne means nothing else than uh, positive charges are sources of field lines, negative charges are sinks of field lines, and we cannot have situations such as this one here that field lines just stop somewhere in the vacuum. So this cannot happen. And well, okay, so this is, we want this because uh, otherwise we may be doing an interesting many body mod model, but not uh, necessarily a gauge theory. Um, yeah, so, so this is the, the Hamiltonian here that we want to implement. Uh, but now if you look at these uh, quantum devices, uh, what we have is we have uh, discrete ions or we have discrete lattice sites in the optical lattice. So we want actually a lattice uh, implementation, but there we can use literature that has, been, that has been developed in the high energy community for decades uh, that tells us how we can take QED and put it on a lattice. Um, so here specifically we follow the kogut saskin prescription uh, that works as follows. So it takes the fermionic spinor and puts electrons and positrons alternatingly on different lattice sites. And then the gauge field lives on the link uh, in between. Um, so then we get this uh, lattice Hamiltonian, uh, we have a, uh, now the kinetic energy becomes a hopping term where the 
uh, the coupling to the gauge field now uh, gets through this parallel transporter, which can be understood as e to the i, the vector potential essentially. Um, and then we have the fermions here, which where the rest mass now just becomes uh, this uh, staggered fermion prescription of, uh, so where we get the minus one to the j, which tells us uh, that we have uh, electron and positron signs. Um, okay, now the Gauss law is just uh, gets discretized, so the divergence of the electric field just becomes now the difference of two electric fields to the left and right of a matter side. Okay, but this is still uh, a local conservation law that we have to achieve. Um, okay, now the question is uh, how do we implement actually the gauge field? Okay, so this is the, the difficult part. Um, so here, uh, so there's one approach which, for example, we followed in Innsbruck uh, and which is also done. Uh, you can also interpret the experiment in the Lukin group uh, in this way, um, where one integrates out either the meta or the gauge fields, and then one gets an effective theory that has only one of these degrees of freedom in a sort of an addressed, uh, um, well, in an addressed form. Um, but here we want really to implement both degrees of freedom in the quantum device. Okay, so we really want to have the, the gauge field as an active degree of freedom there. Um, so the question is how one can put this now into an optical lattice, and there we use the quantum link model formalism, um, which looks a bit weird, but it's, it's actually it's very simple. So it, one just takes this parallel transporter and replaces it by an S plus spin operator. And we take the electric field uh, operator and just to replace it by SD. Okay, so this um, uh, fulfills still our canonical commutation relations that we want. Um, but what it does essentially is it cuts the, uh, the electric field, which could go from minus infinity to plus infinity. It cuts it off into a certain range from minus S to plus S, uh, where this is the, the length of the spin. Um, so this sounds like a crude approximation uh, for the electric field, but actually it's a well-defined thing. So if, you, so if you plug it in, uh, we see that we still, most importantly, we still get a U1 gauge theory. So we still have a local generator of a U1 symmetry. Um, and in addition, we uh, recover, uh, this is also very important, we recover quantum electrodynamics in the usual sense in well-defined limits. So if you take the spin length to infinity, we know that we get out uh, uh, QED and also we can do something that is called uh, dimensional reduction. So we go to high, one dimension higher and then in one dimension lower we also get QED. Yeah. So in this sense, uh, for example, so Uwe Jens Wiese who is really propagating this quantum link model formalism, um, so he maintains that actually quantum electrodynamics is just a special case of the quantum link model. So not the quantum link model is an approximation of QED, but uh, QED is just one point of the more general class of quantum link models. Okay, so that is, <laughs> we can see it both ways, I guess. Um, okay, but for us it's important that we, we are doing a, uh, this U1 gauge theory which shares many features, features with QED. Um, okay, so this is the model that we want now to implement and we want to implement it in an optical lattice. So in particular, we want to implement it in a bosonic lattice that is described by the the Hubbard model, so we can have different chemical potentials for A and B sites. Uh, and here already I distinguish uh, A sites, which are going to represent the, the fermionic matter. Okay, so these are these more shallow sites. And then the B sites, which are deeper, and these represent the gauge links. Okay, uh, okay so we have these uh, bipartite lattice. Then we can have single particle hopping as is usual between neighboring lattice sites. Uh, and we have also on-site interactions. So the question is, how do we get this model here into this model over there? Um, but that we do uh, a couple of more transformations. The first one is quite simple. We just do a jordan digner transformation to uh, get these fermions into, into bosons. So then no fermion becomes an empty shallow site. One fermion becomes a, a filled shallow site. Um, now for the links, we do one very crude approximation. We take the spin representation of this quantum link model just to one half. Okay, so now the electric field has just two possibilities. It can point to the right or it can point to the left. Because it's very coarse-grained. Um, 
but that makes the life simple for us because we then just need two different states. And here we use on the B bosons, we don't use zero and one, we use zero and two as our uh, basis states to represent these two configurations of the links. Um, well, in addition to make life a little bit uh, even simpler, we make a staggered rotation to get rid of these minus one to the J signs here. Um, so this just makes the lattice structure a little bit simpler. So if you do this, we get now this bosonic Hamiltonian here, uh, which isn't just an exact rewriting uh, if we know that we uh, that we really project onto the hardcore bosonic or this what well, is only these bosonic states. Um, again, now we want to implement this in the optical lattice. But uh, so let's first look at what actually now the this meta gauge coupling term what it has become. So now uh, if you write it like that, um, the term now is this that we annihilate two bosons on neighboring side and then they go to the link in between. So we go now to this configuration. Um, so what this does is, is the following. So if we now look in the interpretation of our gauge theory, if we have fermionic charges everywhere, two charges are annihilated. So these lattice sites now become empty and we flip the electric field from left to right. Okay, so now what this has done, we have these charges which have, which has, which have overscreened the field, they've gone away and now we just go from, the field just goes from the positive charge all the way to the negative charge. Uh, as it should do by Gauss as well. Okay. Uh, so just a very simple, now this uh, meta gauge coupling has this simple interpretation of two neighboring charges can annihilate or generate out of the vacuum. Um, okay, now we want to implement this effectively in our Bose Hubbard model. And the way to do this uh, is we allow the nearest neighbor tunneling here, but on purpose, I drew this lattice side deeper. So they have a different chemical potential, which gives us a strong off resonance here, which means that this configuration can be achieved only virtually. And then the second boson has to come. Uh, and now by the interaction of the two bosons sitting now on the gauge link, uh, this configuration is lifted into resonance with this configuration. And so we go in a second order process from here to there and have achieved our gauge matter coupling. Um, and then what is more, we get the rest mass essentially for free because now we can just, uh, by changing the lattice step, uh, make the, uh, these two configurations slightly uh, off resonant. Okay. Um, and so then, uh, so we, uh, uh, so then we, we do not, comp the interaction does not completely compensate uh, for this lattice side being deeper. Um, which means that you can reinterpret as saying that, okay, if we have the charges sitting here, this has a higher energy. So that these charges have a rest mass. Um, okay, so now what, what do we have achieved until now? Well, we, we have massaged the model. We started from QED, we have massaged it in more and more ways to make it simpler and simpler. And uh, now what we have achieved is we have really um, a huge simplification over previous proposals. So first of all, the lattice structure is very simple. It's just a super lattice. So there are many groups that have this. Um, in addition, we only need one single atomic species, one bosonic species. We don't need different internal states. Uh, we don't need fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom uh, as in many previous proposals that interact with each other. Also this gauge matter coupling, usually this is the bottleneck. And usually this is a very, very slow process, but here we just achieve it in second order. Uh, perturbation theories, it's a, actually a quite fast process. Um, okay, so now uh, uh, once we had to develop uh, this mapping, uh, uh, we talked to, uh, to Bing Yang, who immediately said, okay, I can do this uh, and I can do it in a large system. And so they uh, wanted to look at, uh, so they implemented this and then one, one, they were wondering what is uh, interesting physics that we can look at in this model. So, I mean, we've cooked it down and, uh, to make it simpler and amenable to implementation, but is, so we have now a potentially scalable implementation, but the question is, um, can we look at uh, relevant phenomena uh, in this implementation? Um, and so the answer is yes. So for example, um, the simple quantum link model shares a quantum phase transition with QED, which goes under the name of Coleman's phase transition. Um, and so this transition works as follows. Um, 
this configuration that I showed you before is where we have all these uh, charges sitting everywhere with the overscreened field. Well, this corresponds to a rest mass going to infinity. So we want to have charges as much as possible. But now, uh, if we increase the rest mass and go to very large positive mass, we do not want to have any charges anymore. So the particles should disappear. They annihilate each other, and now the electric field just goes through. Okay? Um, and so it can go, go through like this, or it can go through in the opposite direction. So remember, we have only two possibilities. So these are the only two uh, possibilities for the electric field to be allowed. Um, but all these two, these two configurations, uh, they are completely degenerate, excepting boundary terms. And the thermodynamic limit, they become a, um, a degenerate. And we get a symmetry breaking phase transition from here to there. So somewhere in between, there's a critical point. And now we wanted to probe uh, and see if we can uh, see this critical physics. Uh, so they implemented this in a large system of 71 lattice sites, uh, which I think is very nice because then we can see really many body physics, and then tuned the interaction and this offset, uh, so to go from large negative mass to large positive mass. Um, and so here's, I'm going to plot as a function of time now, uh, the meta density, uh, so the, the number of uh, particles essentially, and then the double number, so the number of electric fields that have flipped accordingly. And so, well, when we go through the phase transition, we see the following. So here the bullets are data points. We see we start in a state which has uh, charges everywhere. And as we approach the phase transition, these, these charges annihilate and go down to a very low level. And at the same time, the electric field compensates for this, for the annihilation of the charges and, and flips. And so we get large uh, number of down ones. And so this agrees also very well with uh, the DMRG calculations. Um, okay, so I think this is, this is really nice. Now we can really look at gauge theories, uh, many body physics in gauge uh, theories in these uh, quantum simulators. Um, but now, of course, one can play devil's advocate and ask, well, okay, we see some sort of transition, but uh, is this really a gauge theory that we are seeing there? Um, so we're also wondering about this question. Can we show that we really have gauge invariance? So, uh, what we actually want is uh, we want to show that we have only essentially these three configurations. So for a positron side, the field lines, they have to come out or they go through in this direction or in that direction. Okay? And for this uh, S equal one half quantum link model, these are really the only three gauge invariant configurations that are allowed. And in the mapping to the Bose Hubbard model, these become these three configurations here. Okay? Um, now, of course, in principle, the bosons uh, there could be three bosons sitting on the deep sides. There could be two bosons here or one boson here and one boson there. There are, so there are many, many configurations that I can think about which would not fall into uh, this category here and so which would break Gauss's law. Um, so now we want to measure how much really do we maintain only these three configurations. Um, so if one had a, a, a quantum gas microscope, which uh, so Emmanuel Bloch, for example, talked about this, um, so there one can just make a snapshot and then look at the bosons that one has and different lattice sites, site result, and just uh, from this counting, uh, certify the gauge invariance. In that experiment, they don't have a quantum glass microscope, um, but instead they were able to still get uh, the figure of merit that we want, namely the gauge violation, so that the number, so how many, what is the probability of having these three allowed uh, configurations, or the deviation from this probability, uh, and the way how they did is they combined uh, like 10 different measurements. So they, uh, they were able uh, to, uh, to count the number of uh, triplons averaged over the entire lattice. They were able to uh, deform the super lattice structure such that uh, they could ex uh, extract how many, how's the probability to have one particle here and one particle in the neighboring side and things like this. Um, okay. Uh, so they combined all these measurements and what I would say like, like almost an heroic experiment uh, and then were able to really certify this gauge violation across uh, all the sweep uh, that they've done. And so here is the result. Uh, this is a log scale and you see that throughout all the sweep, despite all the dissipation and all the things that are going on, the violation of gauge invariance remains on a very low level uh, all the time. Okay, so this I find uh, really quite amazing, and this is really it's the first time that uh, Gauss's law 
was certified in a, in a quantum simulator of this type. Okay, so this I find uh, quite a, a, really an, an amazing result. Um, and it also shows us that we are doing the right thing. That so the mapping that we did and everything it works. So in practice, we really get uh, to a very good degree. We get the gauge theory out. Um, okay. So in the last. Uh, uh, so can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the uh, fermion mass and the gauge coupling, e, which parameter regime are you effectively able to access here? by kind of truncating the Hilbert space of the electric field. So here the, um, to me, the sorry, the gauge coupling E, so M over E, this is your question, or the other yeah, gauge, I, the hopping. Yeah, or just uh, which, I guess more generally, just which uh, regime of the so, parameter space. Um, okay, so we can, uh, so let me go to the Hamiltonian for a second. Uh, uh, okay, here essentially, so what we have is essentially we have the, kinetic energy, and we have the rest mass. So the, these two terms we can tune very, very freely. So uh, as you've seen, it goes from minus, uh, minus 40 to plus 10 or something like this. Okay, so uh, they have very large uh, freedom. Uh, what concerns the, so usually in QED we have also the, the charge, <laughs> the elementary charge E. Uh, here in this quantum link model it drops out completely. Um, so this means essentially we are we are in a strong coupling regime always. Yeah. Um, okay, that's uh, what I was wondering about. Okay. Yeah. Um, so currently uh, we're working on, so there's also, uh, for example, Thorsten, who I see is in, also in the audience is involved in this. Uh, we are currently looking at when you take larger spin representations, um, so what are the coupling regimes that you uh, effectively can, can access or uh, what are the regi regimes where it could become similar to, to QED again. Um, yeah, because for a higher because for higher spin representations, the elementary charge again enters, and uh, so um, so then you could also tune. But uh, yeah, so here I mean this experiment has only s equal one half, so then it drops out, and we want some strong cup. Okay, thanks. Mm, okay, any more questions? Maybe to this uh, implementation part. If not, so then I, I like in the, in the last part, I'd like to dwell a little bit more on this question of how we can ensure the reliable working of this thing, and especially in this point of view of uh, the gauge, uh, the gauge symmetry. Um, okay. Um, so because, okay, so the, in essence, what we want is uh, we have a quantum simulator that has some degrees of freedom, and we want to, to convince it that it should obey Gauss's law. And, in a very generic setting, we will have some Hamiltonian that we do want, which makes the gauge theory, and then there will always be some residual terms that will break uh, the gauge invariance in some form. Uh, and then, so the question is, how severe are these, and what can we do about them? Um, and so that's a question that we are wondering a lot uh, lately. Um, so pictorially, we can take our now our, sta our states. Uh, so this is a <laughs> box represents all the states that fulfill Gauss's law. The Gauss law generated G on them is equal to zero, and there will be the good gauge theory dynamics happening within these states. Uh, so that's good. But then we have the bad states where G is not equal to zero, and this lambda H one will bring us in there uh, typically. So this is not what we want. So the question is, how can we ensure that we get only the good dynamics and well, one thing that one can do, and which has been discussed in the literature, is to add a term uh, HG, which is just the Gauss law square. And now this term will uh, effectively push up all the undesired states that do not fulfill Gauss's law. They will, it will push it up in energy. And then this term uh, that would like to couple these different gauge sectors gets off resonant and uh, essentially gets killed. Um, and so this. Adding this term has been actually discussed in a whole bunch of proposals uh, to then generate the desired dynamics in second order perturbation theory by going up here and uh, coming back. And also I should point out uh, that similar things like uh, different uh, sectors and so on, this has also been discussed uh, in the context of uh, topological order. Um, okay, so now, but now if we think about implementations in quantum simulators, adding G square is actually quite complicated. 
Um, because but if you square the Gauss law, so you have the electric field and some bit of psi, uh, you get something like this. So these are actually interactions between not only nearest neighbor, but next nearest neighbor. So in the, for example, in the Bose Hubbard model, we have only on site interactions. Um, and now we want interactions not only between nearest neighbors, but also between next nearest neighbors, and they should be in a precisely tuned manner and so on. So this becomes uh, in principle possible, but right now it's just uh, such more experimental overhead that none of these list of proposals that I just showed you uh, has been achieved in an experiment. Okay, so uh, we were thinking about, can we do this protection in a simpler way? And then also we wanted to understand how well does it actually do protect the dynamics of the gauge theory. Um, so the, the, for the, regarding the first question, can we do it simpler? Uh, well, yes, we can. Uh, then we can just use uh, terms that are linear in the Gauss law. Uh, but now we need to be careful. We need to add a coefficient, coefficient in front because if we just add some over JGJ, then we get just uh, global charge conservation or something like this, but it's not, doesn't give us the local symmetry that we want. But if we choose these coefficients in a clever way, um, namely that CJGJ is equal to zero, if and only if all of the local Gauss law generators are zero, then the following happens. The good sector remains where it was uh, around zero energy, but the bad sectors are now shifted up, uh, shifted up in energy and shifted down energy. Okay, so for equilibrium physics, this will not work because um, we will. Uh, so if you thermalize, we will go down somewhere here, um, but so in, in the wrong sector. But if we initialize the dynamics somewhere in the right sector, we will just stay there um, and be. Uh, dynamically protected by these gaps. Okay? Uh, and so I want to emphasize that this is really nice because these are just single body terms that you can add, uh, such as the local chemical potentials in, in the optical lattice. Okay? So this is something that is uh, completely feasible uh, experimentally. Um, and so, well, when we wrote down this theory, we actually realized that we can reinterpret what we have done in this experiment. So when, when we designed more in an ad hoc way, we can really put into more general theory framework uh, in this form. Um, so in fact, this has been done in an experiment uh, in a simplified form. Um, okay, so the question is how, the second question, how well does it help us to protect? Uh, so we did some uh, numerical studies on that. Uh, so I'm going to plot here the gauge violation as a function of the time. And uh, so here we see that if you don't have any protection, then we just, the gauge violation at some point will just go up and then we, that this system doesn't know anymore that it should be a gauge theory. It has, it's completely random, the, the eigenvalue of uh, the Gauss law. But by increasing the protection term, we can uh, keep the gauge violation on a controlled level uh, for essentially all simulated times uh, up to 10 to the 10, so essentially infinite times for all practical purposes. Uh, and so this protection is on a controlled level of violation strength divided by uh, protection strength uh, squared. Okay, so we get a very robust uh, thing even at long times. Um, but no one can ask, uh, so this is actually for a small system of uh, just uh, six, uh, okay, six meta sites and uh, six gauge sites. Um, so one can ask what happens in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, so we did, uh, so it's actually, uh, this is actually a very pertinent question because for large systems, uh, we will start actually to overlap these different sectors. So there's actually not really a gap anymore between them. And then the question is, do we actually leak out now if we drive the dynamics? Okay. Um, so we did the calculations with uh, IMPS uh, and so infinite matrix product set. So we have an infinite thermodynamic limit. And you see for the times that are accessible for this method, uh, we get the same level of uh, controlled violation. Uh, Okay, so this sounds very good, and all the numerics seem to agree that, the that this protection works uh, for, for all simulated times. Uh, of course, we don't know what happens here in the thermodynamic limit at long time, so it could go away, maybe. Um, but so we wanted to understand this even better, and we have uh, some rigorous analytic results that show us that actually the protection works to exponentially long times. Um, so to derive them, it's actually in the end quite simple. We can adapt results from this very nice paper here by Dima Aban and co-workers from just a couple of years back. Um, so this are results in the context of periodically driven systems, so you can immediately apply them here. And so what one needs to do is we take our term HG, 
which is this gauge protection G square or the linear part, the this linear protection, and write down a spectral decomposition. So we have this projectors under different eigenvalues. And then we rewrite our theory uh, in this form where we have the energy protection plus a diagonal part plus an off-diagonal, and these are just diagonal in the eigenvalues of this protection term. Okay, so this HG is the H diagonal is nothing else than the good uh, term that keeps us within the gauge sector and the non-diagonal is the bad term lambda H1 which changes the different uh, sectors of the HG. Um, okay, so given this and then in addition uh, what we need is that HD has an integer spectrum which it has by construction and we also want that the uh, protection strength is large uh, but actually large in a very benign manner. So here it has to be larger than the off-diagonal terms but not infinitely large, just uh, so just so not this is not an extensive norm. This is not the operator norm, but it's just um, this, this kappa norm is non-extensive. Uh, okay? um, yeah, so if we have this, uh, then we know that there exists a unitary transformation that transforms our theory in the following way: the protection term remains the diagonal, the good part remains perturbatively close to the initial one, and the not uh, the non-diagonal part is exponentially suppressed. So there's, a, uh, okay, so there's an exponential times something in some power of the protection strength. Okay, so let me rephrase what this means is, um, so if you add a, a strong uh, protection term but the size independent protection term V, uh, then the, uh, this HG becomes an emergent symmetry and it remains though for exponentially long times until this small term here can kick in. Okay, so we see indeed from this, we can understand why we get this excellent protection and we see even two infinite times. Okay, um, okay so why I think this is interesting? Well, because it shows us that we can really do something in a quantum simulator which will break gauge invariance. We can do something to engineer it in a way that we keep the gauge invariance on a level that we want and keep it there for a very, very long time. Um, but, but this, uh, okay, I just brush over why this actually works so because actually we're protecting here only a global symmetry, but we can design it in a way that it helps us to protect the, the local symmetry of the Gauss's law that we actually want. Um, yeah, because HG is just, it's a sum or something is a local, so it's a, in principle a global symmetry. Okay, um, okay but this is more subtle, but anyway, so the, the, it works. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me uh, conclude. Um, so the first thing that I, uh, so in this uh, steps towards large scale applications, what we want to do is we want to, uh, so we really now want more scalable implementations and we've seen that we have achieved this, for example, with 71 sites here, and there's similar, similarly large systems in the groups of Rainer Blatt and Michel Lukin. So we have really achieved now this uh, first goal. Um, also the question is, can we not right now uh, tackle relevant phenomena well, I've discussed the Coleman phase transition. We've also looked at the Schwinger mechanism of particle generation that is within reach. And what I find also very nice by thinking about uh, these things, we've also found new phenomena. So, uh, for example, with uh, Thorsten uh, and others in Heidelberg, um, we found a new uh, type of a dynamical topological transition that was not known in the systems uh, before. Okay? So there's even new physics coming up. Uh, with uh, my postdoc, John Halliway, we found uh, a new phenomenon that we call the staircase pre thermalization. Um, so it would be interesting actually to, to see also how these are uh, related to the, this pre thermalization, for example, how it's related to the slow dynamics and disorder free localization that one sees in gauge theories, uh, which I think also Marcello Del Monte has talked about. Uh, and so there are many, many questions that now come really within reach. So to look at entanglement dynamics uh, in gauge theories and so on. Um, okay, I also mentioned how we, uh, our efforts to ensure the reliable working of these quantum simulators. Um, but I think what the next step really has to be now, uh, we have now simple theories, but now we want to go uh, further and further and have more complex uh, theories. So um, we want to go to higher dimensions to non-abelian theories, but all this uh, requires, of course, much more thought and overhead. Um, okay, but so with this, I want to thank the team. So in my group, this is Jar, Typhon, and Julius. And we have uh, a whole lot of uh, external collaborators uh, on the context of uh, like the stage theories, uh, all of whom I want to thank. 
Uh, and I want to thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks, Philip. Uh, if um, anyone has questions, feel free to, uh, oh, there's one raised hand. Okay, uh, Subir, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, well, very nice talk. Uh, but, I mean, you made a lot of strong claims, so I'm going to be a little bit aggressive, apologize. Uh, okay. I really don't buy that this is the gauge theory. Uh, you know, that's an interpretation. I'm sure it's the correct interpretation, but it's not really that useful. I mean, uh, you're in a very confining phase of, a, of what you call a gauge theory. Uh, and uh, there's many other interpretations of the same model without ever invoking gauge field, which is what you expect in the confining phase generally. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, I don't know what you mean by saying that there's a gauge constraint that's approximately violated. A gauge constraint cannot be approximately valid. In a gauge theory, gauge constraints are exactly preserved. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the way you do that is by saying, if you want to rescue the gauge invariance in your model, as you say, you have some ma very massive matter fields which are gate charged. When you include those, then, ev then everything is exactly preserved. I mean, I think that would be a better way of, mm -hmm. uh, of interpreting your model as a gate theory by invoking additional matter fields that you didn't talk about. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, these are very, uh, very good and, uh, and important uh, comments. Uh, um, Okay, so let me see. So the uh, the first one. Um, so okay, so um, it is true. For example, so let me see. So uh, uh, so I mean, so for example, the, the system of Michel Lukin, they just did some Rydberg experiment where they had nearest neighbor uh, some nearest neighbor constraint, and then can they, one can map this to the gauge theory. So in this sense, there are different ways of writing this. This is right. Um, so I still uh, maintain it's a gauge theory in the in the following sense that we have uh, and it's connected to your second uh, uh, comment. Um, so we have a gauge theory in the following sense that we have these different degrees of freedom and we have ensured that they fulfill a local conservation law, right? Um, Approximately. Approximately, exactly. So uh, that's right. So, um, There's no such thing. Is it? Exactly. I'm coming to this uh, sorry, in, in, in a second. Um, but so also I, I, I must uh, highlight that what we are doing here is, uh, so we want to implement this in these optical lattices um, and we need to, to start somewhere. So these are uh, the first uh, steps. I mean, uh, one has to consider that, for example, the experiment uh, four years ago in the group of Rainer Blatt, these were just four lattice sites. Okay, now we have achieved 71 lattice sites. But I agree that what we want to do now is we want to go to more complex situations. And this is also the, this last point that I said. So for example, we want to go uh, to higher dimensions where the system becomes richer, where we actually do have a, a, a phonon, for example, as a, a propagating particle. Photon, you mean. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with that. You know, you could start with your type of models in higher dimensions where the gauge constraint, at least what you call a gauge constraint, is only approximate. Uh, but then there's an emergent phase. So there's some phase that emerges exactly. where it so has a deconfined yeah. gauge field. And in the description of that phase, the gauge, there will be an emergent gauge charge, which is exactly conserved. Exactly. So this, and this I don't to... see that happening here. <laughs> well, so um, so this co connects to this. Uh, yes, it's exactly. So the second question. Um, so we see that we have approximately fulfilled the gauge invariance, and this was also one question that bothered us. Um, we have now new uh, numerics where we uh, so we look at the ground state of this model uh, and look at the, at the phase diagram as a function of increasing gauge violation. Uh, and there we see that we, uh, so we remain, in, so we, the phase diagram, so to say, remains intact um, as we increase the phase. I don't, sorry, I don't have the, uh, the pictures here. Yeah, this is a uh, model in so 1D or 2D? This is this one, 1D model. Um, okay, so we uh, get exactly the same phase diagram as we increase uh, gauge violation and, until we get to a phase transition point and then uh, things behave completely differently. Um, so, and I, so this is also exactly uh, one way how we interpret this. 
is that we can uh, couple this to a, to a Higgs field and so on, and then uh, get an, so there should be an, an emergent, ex an exact uh, gauge symmetry that is close to this uh, effective one that we are. Right, right. I, I think, yeah, I, I'm happy with that. Yeah, OK. <laughs> So this, but this is exactly. So this is this is ex exactly an important question. So this, uh, we see that we have a low level of I don't know 0 0.01 violation. Uh, what does it mean? <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. so, but it, but we see that also in the dynamics, as long as we have this low, vi very low violation in the dynamics for short times, this, this is another claim that we can make. But for short times, the dynamics uh, is essentially indistinguishable from the dynamics of the uh, of the real gauge uh, theory uh, with full gauge uh, invariance. And then what we see is as the level of gauge violation increases, we go away far uh, more rapidly. OK, fair enough. Sorry, you know, I'm sorry for being so aggressive, but yeah, thank you for your no, no, thanks for, uh, <laughs> no, thanks for giving the opportunity to clarify this. <laughs> OK, maybe one more question if anyone has one. Uh, I can maybe ask one more. So in this rigorous result that you talked about at the end, so uh, can you say again, the result is about a time scale up to which you don't transition out of the gauge invariant subspace, is that right? Yeah, exactly, so we can, um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, so the result uh, is, uh, so it's, it's really, it tells us that we uh, can, Get this approximate gauge invariance to exponentially long times in the if you do out of equilibrium dynamics. Um, so and like I mean previously, uh, previous results tell us that we can get this in, in some perturbative sense, but we don't know what higher order perturbations do. Uh, and here essentially we know that now that we can go to infinite order in perturbation. And the important point is that this protection strength to achieve this doesn't need to scale with the system size. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow, uh, well, I, I think uh, somehow one thinks that this should be, be the case, but uh, to really be able to write it down and, and show it, uh, if you see this, that we don't need to scale this uh, protection strength to infinity, I think this is a nice result. Okay, and this, so V, you want it to be large here, is that right? And then? Exactly. This v, F of... Uh, what is uh, making it exponential? Is it a power of the number of lattice sites, or is it? I'm um... oh, sorry. It's exponential, uh, exponentially small uh, in the protection strength. Uh, so oh, the, okay. the, the, the error terms becomes some number that is smaller than one to essentially this essentially linear in the protection strength. Ah, I see. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay, if there's no more questions, then let's thank Philip again and uh, look out for Hassan's email about the next seminar, which should be next week. All right, uh, take care, everyone. Take care.